What do you say, everybody? It's time for Crimson Tide Headlines here on the Bama Insider YouTube channel. He's Jay Barker. I'm Mick Gillespie. Great to have you guys with us as we talk to you about everything going on in the world of Alabama. The Crimson Tide getting ready to take on Vanderbilt. That'll be the SEC opener. But before we get into anything else, guys, like and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up. That's a way of saying roll tide as you hang out with us here on the Bama Insider YouTube channel. Also, hit the bell. That way you'll know every time we go live, you'll be able to go live with us, right? Well, at least you just click on it. You don't have to get in StreamYard and, you know, and get Chris and Jay all timed up like I do and vice versa. Uh, all you got to do is just turn on and watch. What's up, Jay? What's happening, Mick? How are you, man? I got my Diet Coke. I just need my Golden Flake potato chips, and I'll be ready to go. You'd, you'd be, be like, like Bear Coach Bryant. Show. Yeah, you'd be like Bear <laughs> Bryant, right? No doubt. How are you? Where are you at today? I'm in uh, Rocket City, uh, the uh, Trash Panda Stadium for game two of the playoffs. So, All right. We, You're going to uh, make it happen? Uh, we didn't do too well game one. First pitch. <laughs> First pitch home was run. a double. Second double. pitch was a home run. Yeah, we never. Oh, we my never. goodness. And we just lost. So, so we'll see. <laughs> it's a bet. Like if, if Rocket City wins tonight, they take the, they take, they go to the championship series. So I got you. Got a work cut out for us. But football wise, um, guys, hit us in the comment section. Want to hear from all of you and uh, your thoughts on things. Jay, we get the 2023 football schedule. It's released. Uh, let's that. take a look at it. Yeah. And your thoughts. Look at that. At uh, well, it's uh, Middle Tennessee, then Texas, then at South Florida. Wow, that's a weird matchup for the Crimson Tide. Uh, Ole Miss at Mississippi State, at Texas AM, Arkansas, Tennessee, open date LSU, at Kentucky, Chattanooga, UTC, and then at Auburn. Um, I think that schedule is a lot easier than this year's schedule just because of the way that the road games have kind of worked out. But um, uh, any surprises on there? How about South Florida? I mean, Alabama playing at South Florida, that's, geez, that's a weird game for the Crimson Tide to play. Yeah, especially at South Florida. I mean, big for them. Gosh, I mean, they may get the uh, defending national champions coming into town uh, next year. But um, I, I was surprised by that. I mean, nor normally Alabama doesn't go play a team like that. But I think nowadays it's just tougher with schedules and looking for all the, uh, you know, great things. That um, you know you're used to seeing as far as great games early in, early in the year, or stuff like that. It's just getting tougher with um, you know these games. At least we got Texas, the second game again, and they'll be back in, in Bryant Denny Stadium. But at Mississippi State, uh, you got uh, Ole Miss there pretty early uh, uh, next year. Uh, at Texas A and M, and then you keep going down Arkansas, Tennessee, then the open date, then LSU, which you get LSU in Tennessee at home next year, then at Auburn. So. Be a, good, be a good schedule once again. Tough SEC West schedule as well as the uh, Tennessee as well as well as they're playing right now, number 11 in the country. So we'll see where they are coming up next year. But, yeah, that South Florida game was weird to see when I saw it come up on the schedule. But, you know, Greg Burns, he, he's out there looking, trying to find teams to come play, and maybe that was just the only thing they could figure out and, and get fit into the schedule. I, I don't see one of those kickoff games, which I knew because we know what the mm -hmm. non-conference schedule is pretty much going to look like. But this year right. didn't have one. Uh, that next year don't have one as well. I kind of miss those. I, I like those, those early season games uh, in a neutral site. Yeah, it's more – I think they, they realize, number one, the fan experience, even though I think some people like to travel. Um, really two things. One was that fans were going, look, okay, we're going to travel there for the beginning of the year. Then we got to go to a playoff game and then to a national championship. So we got to spend three vacations, uh, you know, going to watch Alabama. Uh, more probably that they want more games at home and more games where they have, you know, the Texas home and home type matchups where it's going to benefit the community. It's going to benefit restaurants, bars, all that type of stuff and be a big economic uh, get for, you know, whichever team is hosting that particular game that year. That's kind of the, the mentality now. Uh, I think they're kind of kind of over the neutral sites a little bit, too. And um, and just want to get back to this home and home matchup. So that's that's um, that's kind of where it is right now. It's kind of what we've heard from all the athletic directors and the people that are kind of running the CFP that they're doing more of those type of games. I think those neutral site games would probably go away. You completely. think it's you think that the uh, the playing at South Florida is because it's in Tampa. I mean, don't they play at Raymond James Stadium? You know, is there a chance that Alabama could play there again, or is just nothing to do with it? It, it could be that, and you know, the other thing I thought about it earlier was that it could be 
they went to Coach Saban and said, hey, you know, we, we have a matchup in, in Florida, at South Florida. We don't play Miami. We don't play Florida State. We don't play Florida. Uh, but it's a chance for them to get down and, and recruit and, and really be a, uh, kind of a presence uh, mm -hmm. coming into that heavy, heavy um, recruiting uh, mecca of, of talent that's in that area, that it would be a chance for Alabama's brand to be seen players to maybe come out that are being recruited by South Florida, Florida or other teams, and even for the coaches, go down and watch some Friday night games. So maybe players they want to look at and see for not only next year's or 2024, but uh, then and, and beyond that as well. So that could be a, a play on it. Um, but yeah, when I saw it, I was just like, you was kind of like, that doesn't seem right. Alabama doesn't travel to South Florida. South Florida travels to Alabama uh, instead. So, uh, but there, there must've been some conflicts or they just felt like that was a good, a good fit and also a good place to go. So that's it. That's next year's schedule. And um, you know what? This week we play Vanderbilt. This year's schedule, Bama's 3-0 and going into this game on Saturday, 6-30 against Vanderbilt. Uh, Saban talked about the Vandy game plan. Is that a, Do we have an audio clip for that? Yeah, let's play that now. You mentioned at the top that Vanderbilt's offense is a little different than what you've seen. What are a couple of the wrinkles that, that make it unique? Well, um, I'll talk about their offense. I'm not talking about what we're going to do. You want me to tell you what we're going to do so they know? I mean, I, I can just call their coaches and <laughs> dial it up for you. But, um, you know, the, the, there's elements of, you know, often, uh, option football in what they do. Uh, and, you know, that's not something that we see all the time. Uh, so our players got to have really distant eye control. And, you know, when the point of attack moves, uh, they've got to be able to adapt correctly and everybody play responsibility football that's that's what it comes down to but you know they're very capable of throwing the ball as well so you got to play good pass defense and not give up explosive plays while you're trying to do that i love it jay i love it when nick saban gets irritated with the reporters and unless you're from mexico yeah. he doesn't like you asking questions that's right and um he he always says all that but then he still answers the question uh, right. He even did it at the very end of the press conference when he's asked about injuries. He's like, I thought I could get through this without doing an injury report. And then he goes on to tell the injury report. So yeah. <laughs> even as much even as much as he doesn't want to, uh, he still does it, still gives them that. that. But uh, I like that. I like that about him. He kind of he rings them a little bit uh, when it comes to some of the questions that are asked. And, and I don't think he was even asking, like, what's your game plan? I think he was just saying, what, what we know, what, what do you see in this team? You know, what are you going to defend? That type of stuff. Um, but you know, you just catch him in those moods sometimes. And then he had some laughter at one point in time with DJ Dale, uh, had, had called, uh, Henry Toa Toa a genius. And, um, so I, I know we got that, 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 uh, those comments as well. You want to go to those? Yeah, let's play those now All and right. get right into it. All right. Yesterday, uh, DJ Dale called Henry Toa Toa a genius. How does Henry's ability to understand offenses help his teammates in preparation? I thought you were going to ask how D.J. Dale really could recognize a genius, but I, I, I get it. Um, <laughs> D.J.'s a good guy. I don't mean it that way, but I was just kidding. Um, you know, Henry's just a really instinctive, smart football player, but he does a really good job of uh, preparing for games, and I think Pete does a really good job with the linebackers understanding, you know, how they fit relative to, you know, whatever the call is. And um, Henry is one of those guys that, you know, he gets it. He sees it almost like a coach. Uh, he's a great communicator. So I think because he makes calls up front, that really makes the, the, the other part of the front seven feel more comfortable and confident in what they're doing and how, how we can execute together as a group. Well, there you, you know, go. he stuttered that much. Yeah. <laughs> He he started to make a joke about DJ Dale, and then I think he was like, "Oh, I got to, he's not going to like that too much. Mm -hmm. I better walk this back a little bit," yeah. because you forget sometimes that you're talking to the media. You know, if you were in the locker room or out on the field, you'd do that, and it'd be funny, and everybody would laugh. Uh, indicatively, somebody would probably be like, write a story saying that he was serious. You know, so right. Yeah, exactly. No, he, I mean, and, and I love that side of him when he laughs and cuts up in, in the, in the uh, press conferences. But, yeah, I, I, probably also because DJ's a big big man. Uh, he didn't want to me make him mad <laughs> <laughs> at all. But, um, yeah, DJ had some really great things to say about Henry Toa Toa, talking about his preparation, 
talking about the leader he has become on this team, even even last year, but even more this year, really finding his role, um, how he gets them in position up front. He really kind of tips off to them, kind of what he feels like is coming, whether it be run or pass, play action, off of formations. And and Coach Saban even talked about how that uh, you know Henry's a great film study guy. That he really he's you know he's an extension of the coaches. Like he's out there on the field, he knows. He studied very hard throughout the week, put the time in in order for him to make those kind of calls and, and get those guys, um, you know, ready for what may be coming at them based on alignment and, and you know, the formations and, and down a distance, the, all those type of things that you study up on in order to get some kind of edge. And, it, and when he's doing that kind of stuff, it's just going to make him a better defense. So good for him. And um, I love that DJ called him a genius. Did you play with anyone like that that you could count on, like that knew the, you know, the plays and – you know, basically could help coach the players as a player, like a coach? Yeah, yeah. Derek Oden was awesome as a middle linebacker. Um, did a terrific job getting everybody lined up, getting them in place. And, and probably the best was Chris Donnelly, who played free safety for us. Chris uh, Chris would have gone on to play in the NFL. He had two bad knees. And he was an all-freshman, I think it was, team at Vanderbilt, transferred into Alabama after that freshman year. Brother Oliver was able to get him to come to Alabama and uh, play free safety for us. And he would get a packet, no lie. I mean, it was probably, let me get it right then, probably that thick of, of information, spreadsheets, all the stuff that, that that they would work up for him throughout the week. And and even you know, like our playbook as an offense during Gene Stallings time was not very – very thick, you know. We 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 were pretty predictable in certain things we did and what we we're going to do off play action. Till Homer got when Homer got there, we were a little bit a little bit different. My senior year, um, and a lot more uh, information had to come into. But I'd go in there and sit with him, and we would talk about certain things, and he would want to know, okay, what are you thinking as a quarterback? And he had played quarterback too, so he he, he kind of had that feeling, and mm -hmm. he he got the guys in the secondary lined up so well. They disguised coverages so well, um, you know, really made a huge difference in that defense side of the ball. He was the quarterback of that defense. He's Jay Barker. I'm Mick Gillespie. Make sure you guys like and subscribe. Hanging out with us here on the Bama Insider YouTube channel. Hit the like button. That's uh, a way that you say roll tide to us as we talk Alabama headlines every Tuesday and Thursday. And make sure you hit the bell so that if we go live, you know, and we can get into everything in the world of Alabama with you guys. And we appreciate all of you in the comments section. If you have any questions in there, uh, we always answer a couple of those or talk about some of your comments uh, at the end of the show. So um, keep them coming. Great to have all of you guys with us here on the channel. Alabama continues to recruit, Jay, and it has really gotten to the point where the Crimson Tide are rolling as far as the recruiting stuff goes. Uh, yesterday, they got Jalen Hale. Earlier this week, Jordan Renald. So Alabama, number one class, and they just keep on piling these guys in. Yeah, and Renald, I mean, gosh, I mean, you talk about a great uh, edge player and, um, you know, another one of those guys will be like a, um, you know, Will Anderson Jr. and Dallas Turner type player. Uh, Andrew Bone, we had him on earlier. He was talking about just how – not only was it big that they got him, but where they got him. I mean, with Texas, everything that's happened with Jalen Hill, you're talking about going to be an outstanding receiver for the Crimson Tide in years to come. But uh, he was a guy that, you know, they had to go out and really recruit hard. And I, t I tell you, uh, Holman w Wiggins did a tremendous job with him. Uh, when he was on his official visit late in July, he actually did a, a, a FaceTime with uh, JMO, uh, Jameson Williams, and said, hey, tell him about why, you know, we are wide receiver U. And I, I love the fact that he said that in his comments. He said, look, I want to go play for wide receiver U. And as I said earlier on the show, you know, back in the 80s, 70s, 90s, 2000s till 2007 when Julio Jones – came on campus, and then you had Calvin Ridley, Amari Cooper, and then all these great receivers we've had over the last couple of years that have gone on to be number one draft picks. Alabama is a wide receiver you now. And for, yep. them to be able to, and for them to be able to pull them out of Texas, Mick, you know, especially when you got Texas has Arch Manning coming in next year, supposedly the savior, the guy that's going to be the best player in college football in his tenure, has all the NL, NIL money you could think of, and a guy like Jalen to pick Alabama over Texas, his home state, and for them to get him out of it. And, and actually, he was saying, like, we about Texas uh, back in, what, June and early July, and not till he had that official visit. He came in in July, and um, they did a terrific job getting this kid to come and, and play. He is a burner. Uh, I forget what his 
hundred hundred meter uh, dashes, but his his number is phenomenal and uh, a guy that can really catch the ball. His high school coach had so many great things to talk about him. He mentioned a couple of the guys that came from the high school that have been great receivers. He's kind of a mixture of both of those guys, but has a better knowledge of offense, understands how to run routes better. It's just a more polished receiver uh, that will be coming out of high school. And you saw his numbers from last year. They were phenomenal. And this year already started. I think he's got four touchdowns uh, in the first few games, maybe more, maybe maybe seven. I can't remember what that number is. But, uh, again, they beat Texas. They beat Georgia. They beat A&M. Uh, Alabama got him a good one in this. And here's the thing. Last year, five receivers in the top 100 uh, recruits that Alabama got in last year. And then they got another junior college guy coming in, another rec recruit, a wide receiver. So three guys that still commit to Alabama, even with all that uh, – those guys in that wide receiver room that they know they're going to have to compete against. So uh, this, this kid is an outstanding player and a great gift for Alabama. I think it also Same shows right there. Yeah. Look at that. It also shows me too, that no one, that this group really hasn't solidified itself as the ones that are playing now, the young guys like they're, this is wide open. The competition, Jalen Hale could come in and get a spot on this team if he's ready to go. There, there's no doubt. And I, and I think they love that it is always open competition, especially at that position, especially how the game has changed so much. We need five or six guys that you know that you can get the ball to. But a guy like him can take the top off the coverage. He's like a Jamison because Jamison was a big track guy. This, this guy is um, a phenomenal basketball player, football player and track star. So his coach said he, he's never has off time. This guy's always going hard worker, great work work ethic, and as well as just his knowledge, again, of the game, how to run routes, how to finish routes, how to how to take the top off of a coverage, um, and, and just a great competitor and athlete. So, I, you know, again, big-time commit, a big get for Alabama. Again, it's just a commitment right now. They still got to sign him coming up with this early signing period or in February, but yep. uh, right now it looks really good, and he's said all the right things that points in the direction that he is – Definitely going to hold strong with Alabama. Well, good. And uh, two more for Alabama. We'll have to ask Bone on the tailgate show tomorrow how many spots Alabama has left because uh, starting with Dwindle. Yeah. 23, and then, so about seven spots left. They'll, they'll probably sign about 30 guys, what he told us today. So, okay. uh, And yeah. I, don't mean to, I don't mean to spoil your tailgate show. <laughs> hey, yeah. guys, check Tease out that. the tailgate show tomorrow, <laughs> 6 to yeah. 8. We're going to ask Bone that, and the answer is going to be seven. <laughs> that's right. it should be it should be seven that's right yeah the uh just just know that and if you if you uh hit us in the message board when i ask bone that question and you answer it before he does before he does uh, yeah you'll, yeah you'll you'll be in a drawing for a daniel moore print how about that there you go there you go uh that's all awesome. right let's do prize picks now oh well, well, look, hold on yeah, hold on look, look at this yeah pull yeah. that up good 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 pull up there. Uh, the 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 re class rankings right now. Look at that. Bama with four five stars and sixteen four stars, and the number one class. Crazy. I mean, he just keeps doing it over and over again. Coach Saban is the best recruiter. He he was that way at LSU. He was that way at Michigan State. When he got to LSU, is really when he was able to be surrounded by a ton of talent in the in the Southeastern Conference and uh, just in that Louisiana area. Um, and he changed recruiting. There's so many rules, the bump rule. I mean, you just name them one after another that have been changed because of him and because of his work ethic. But he's just relentless. And, you know, if you're going to coach for Coach Saban, you've got to be a relentless recruiter. You've got to be a guy that can go out and win over the moms, the dads, and the student athlete, the coaches. you got to create those relationships or either have them coming in. And um, it just proves again. I mean, look, he's 70 years old. Everybody's – Nobody thought he'd be there 15 now, be 16 years right now. He's working on his 16th year. Um, I think he'll go another eight, 10 years, to be honest. I don't think he wants to do anything else but this. I think he loves the recruiting process, loves the, a lot of the things that a lot of the coaches don't want to do or don't want to have to do that you got to do to be successful. And, and the great thing about college ball, too, is that those five stars right there, most of those guys that come to Alabama as five stars and even the four stars end up playing in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if you're in the NFL and you're a coach there, you only get – one first round pick he got four possibly five or six by being able to go out and recruit these players and and develop them and get them to that next level so i think that's why the, the college game is probably i don't say it fits him better i think he would have been over time uh, successful in the nfl i really believe that because he's such a great uh, coach and ceo and running an organization the problem was he just didn't have control. I mean, you know, the whole Dante Culpepper, Drew Brees situation that happened early in his tenure there at the Dolphins, you know, he felt like, wait, you know, these are the guys I want to go get. These are the guys that fit my matrix of what – our metrics, excuse me, of what I want uh, as a player at this certain position. And he was having to rely on the GM, 
uh, and the owner and other people in the organization that were making those decisions for him. Here, he's able to go out recruit, meet the parents, really create those relationships. And, I, and I, honestly, I believe it's Coach Coach's wife, uh, Miss Terry, that really was the big decision making there, maker there. And she's probably as as good or better recruiter than he is on recruiting <laughs> visits. I've been on him. I, I was there with Braxton, and she goes around the room, talks to mom. She's she's the uh, um, you know. She's not an introvert like like he is. She's an extrovert. She's the one that can talk to anybody. It makes the room feel like home, and uh, she's been tremendous as a recruiter. She didn't get enough credit for what she does. Yes, no doubt. Well, they did more great recruiting this week with two more yeah. blue-chip prospects. All right, we're going to go to uh, a new feature we're going to have here on the show once a week, and that's prize picks. And We're going to throw up a graphic, Jay, and basically – you tell me if, you know, whoever's up there, which would be Bryce Young, uh, is going to have more or less uh, yards than, you know, what – it's basically over under. And you yeah. can play prize picks at prizepicks.com. It's a pretty cool deal. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing this with you each week. And, you know, they'll have between two and five maybe different, you know, Alabama uh, players on prize picks. Um, but you know, there it is right there. Use, uh, the code roll tide and, um, we'll do a uh, week four prize picks, Alabama against Vanderbilt. All right. That's let's awesome. So, so, yeah. so they'll match, they'll match a hundred dollars up to a hundred dollars, right? Yeah. Up to a hundred dollars. They match whatever you put in. I think I saw on that, that first page. That's awesome. So listen for everybody out there, go out and get a second mortgage, get all the money you can. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're gonna tell them how to, Jay's, you're gonna tell them how to double their money <laughs> yeah i'm saying it, double your money right now don't match it all right <laughs> let's do prize picks all right so here it is over under 265.5 yards against vanderbilt this week and you can see um against ulm he had two 236 against texas 213 um what do you think? I, honestly, I mean, that's a huge number for me. But for Bryce, I think he goes over on this. And the reason why is because I think I think he needs the numbers. I think he, he realized, I think Coach O'Brien, if he wants to kind of stay in the Heisman race, he needs the touchdowns, the yardage. But also I think, too, that they, they want to get these receivers going in the right direction before they get to Arkansas. They know they're going to have to score points, and they're going to want to have you know sustained drives. They want to have explosive plays. Um, I, I could see him going over that 265 this week. Still, it's a big number. I mean, that's that's tough to get to 265, but I think he's going to have some big plays in this game that's going to get in there. Look, if it's the week, it's the week, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be pretty close. I'd probably take the under, but I think it'll be close to that. But the, I, they're going to want to run the ball as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So, And I don't even know if Bryce Young plays the entire game uh, this week. So... I don't know. I think you may see him play longer just based on going into Arkansas, that he wants to get as much uh, uh, reps out of those guys, make sure things are solidified, they're playing disciplined football. I think, too, you want a big win over, over Vanderbilt, even though it's Vanderbilt, it's an SEC team. You want to kind of show that to, to, the, uh, to the world, you know, that, hey, mm -hmm. you know, we are, we are back. We are playing at a high level, uh, both sides of football, special teams. But um, if, now if he only gets to eight minutes and eight seconds in the first half, then everybody – Take the uh, hedge your bet and go the other way <laughs> <laughs> at halftime. <laughs> uh, Prizepicks.com. All right, do we have one more, Chris? Yeah, let's throw up the second one here. All right, uh, Bryce Young, rushing yards. So he had 100 the first week. He had 38 the second week at Texas. He had six last week. It's 15 and a half this week, Jay. Over under. I, I, I mean, again, I would say over on that. I mean, I, but then again, you know, if, if I was looking at him last year, if he gets back to playing that way, and, and actually there, there's been times where the offensive line is blocked very well for him. They got to get better at that uh, in, in certain certain aspects. But where the receivers just weren't getting open, they weren't finishing their routes, cutting them off, and really getting into their the zone or into or running across and clearing a guy out. Um, but I, I mean, you're talking about one run for him. I mean, normally when he takes off, he gains 20 yards. You know, I mean, he's that kind of runner. I'm gonna say over. Mm. I'm going to go under. I, I don't think he's going to run. I don't think he, I think I don't think he'll run at all. I mean, do you get, I'm not a and, gambler. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just it, hoping he goes over. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what it is. <laughs> well, look, look at the trend here. I mean, it was six last week and mm. they, they don't want him to get hit. And then he's it's probably not going to play the fourth yeah. quarter. Yeah. No, don't, I don't know. Don't look, look at Georgia. Run, 
You're right. One run could be 15 and a half yards. All right. If you guys want to do the same thing. The, the again, problem is the the problem is though with rushing yards for quarterback, which I think this is so dumb. Yeah, you get if, lose them when you get sacked. Yeah, if you're in the okay, I'm gonna go under. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Like that's exactly what I was thinking. Well, that and that's what I mean. The thing is, and they need to change that rule. If you're in the pocket and you get sacked, it should not go as rushing yards for a quarterback. If he gets outside the pocket, even outside the tackles, now it's a rushing. Even if he's trying to pass, now it's now it's a rush. But inside the pocket, let's change that rule, football. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That it makes it makes it hard to get 15 yards when you take a couple sacks and all of a sudden now you got to get 20 just to get one. You know? Yeah, yeah. You convinced me. Yeah. All right. Well, good. That's that's what I'm here <laughs> for. All right. That's Prize Picks. We'll do it uh, each week. All right. Let's check out some of your comments. Um, and uh, our questions and 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 kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, great question here. That Middle Tennessee game could be a trap game. Tread lightly, Brother Mick, Brother Jay. Morning, gentlemen. <laughs> morning. Morning, yeah. <laughs> Where's he at? Yeah, that, that was from the beginning of the show. Oh, was um, it? <laughs> yeah. Could, well, let's just talk about that that schedule at the beginning of the year. Uh, well, I mean, at the beginning of the show, next year's schedule. Um, did, did you see any trap games in there? I mean, could going down the South Florida be a trap game? You know, Middle Tennessee's one of those teams they throw the football around. I mean, is, is there is that a trap game? You got to play Texas week two. Alabama hasn't had many trap games. Texas A&M's kind of found uh, the luck in trap games a couple times against Alabama, but it hasn't happened a lot under Nick Saban. Yeah, Utah State, when everybody talked about that one as well, saying, look, you know, they can look past them and look ahead to Texas. So, you know, Middle Tennessee State, I mean, Middle Tennessee being the first game of the year, normally that's not a trap a trap game. That's normally not a, a game you overlook. Everybody's excited about playing and hitting somebody different. Uh, they want to get on the field. They want to play at a high level. They want to show off what they've gotten better at uh, through the summer workouts and through the through the fall camp. So I, I don't see that being a, bi a big issue there. Um, then it's at Texas, then at South Carolina. South Carolina will be a better team uh, under Shane Beamer by that time uh, next year as well. And then, the, the one, I mean, to me is when you get Ole Miss early, I think that's when their their depth is good. They don't have as many injuries and stuff on their defensive and offensive line. Uh, they play probably play better at that point in time. Um, you know, at Mississippi State, at, at Texas A&M, um, Alabama's going to want revenge again on that one from losing that game last year. Uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, um, and, and I I've been really surprised. I mean, Tennessee number 11 right now in, in the country, and they're playing at a high level. I mean, you're up there a bunch. I mean, I know the Tennessee fans – Got to just be jonesing right now and yeah. excited about what's going on. Yeah, and they should be. I'm excited to see what they're going to do. I mean, this is the perfect year for them to get by ten, uh, uh, to Florida, which is Florida. something that they yeah. haven't done in a long time. You know, they've lost a bunch of games to Georgia and Alabama's 15 years. But the, it, the next game on the schedule is uh, Florida. They're both ranked. Uh, I think this is the best Tennessee team that we've seen in a long time, and it'll be fun to watch that game on Saturday. All right, final question Yeah, today. And ten Tennessee's a 10.5-point favorite, right? 11 now. 11, 11, and 11 now. Wow. Wow. Depending on where you, know, where you get your odds, but yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, final uh, comment question. Um, when Nick Saban is being ornery to the media and unsatisfied with his team's performance, we know all is well in Tuscaloosa. I agree with that, yeah. Aero medical, good, good call there. It, it does seem like when he's ornery like that or when he's wanting to make the point that he feels pretty good about his about his team um, or they're playing, it's, it's almost like he, he needs something to get mad about. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and supposedly they've had a really good week of practice, really, really prepared well and, you know, not looking ahead to Arkansas, but just really take care of this game against Vanderbilt. And, you know, Steen, he's got to think a lot of this game. I mean, he left Vanderbilt, left tackle now for Alabama. They're going to be coming after him, trying to confuse him and, try to probably make him look bad in times as a guy that left him. But um, he, he's an outstanding player. Coach Saban had a lot of great things to say about him. Talking about how smart he is, hard worker, great guy, funny to be around. Um, so that was that was really cool to see that uh, he's made such an impact in his early stint so far in, in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Jay, uh, people can check you out every single day, noon to 2, the Jay Barker Show, every Tuesday and Thursday here on the uh, Crimson Tide Headline Show. Uh, you're on the uh, the tailgate show with me every mm -hmm. Friday, uh, normally the first couple segments. Then we're back together again Saturday after the game for the postgame show. So you're busy. 
Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've been dating you for a while now. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, no, it's, it's, it's a ton of fun. And it's fun to jump on here and, and get, to get right to the fans and let them see us, you know, comment, talk about stuff, ask questions. Always a lot of fun. But, yeah, uh, we're on noon to two all across the state. Uh, we're going to be out uh, coming up tomorrow uh, out at Highland Park. I told you about the golf tournament for Striker Strong. So, really uh, excited about that. It's a fun tournament. Do I have about uh, two per hole, the first round, two per, per so what is that? It's a lot. It's uh, 72 teams that they'll end up having for that tournament, and they raise a ton of money, and hopefully we can. A striker who is the son of Robbie Glenn, for a lot of people may not remember, Robbie uh, played back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. We were really good friends in, in college. Uh, my, my first two or three years before he left, went on to play a little bit of uh, minor league baseball. But a baseball player there in Alabama, his son striker. Um, it's like random Tottenham syndrome or something like that. I can't ever pronounce it right, but he got diagnosed. Only like 250 people like worldwide or nationwide have it. Um, and diagnosis is a child then ended up having a uh, brain seizure and had some brain injuries, um, with that. So they've taken this from not only just being about what he was diagnosed with earlier, but also, um, brain injuries for kids and parents are dealing with that and any type of critical care that they might need. So whether it's, um, you know, stuff for the, just to, you know, sometimes it's medical supplies, sometimes it's just diaper, I mean, whatever it is in, in those moments, the littlest of things really count. And so what they're trying to do now is say, look, we, we're, we're going through this. For them, it's a 365, 24-7 ordeal um, that they're doing, and they love their son. And, you know, and they always talk about how strong he is. That's why Striker Strong came about and how much he's taught them about really appreciating life and the people around them and every single day because – I mean, they're just engrossed in this. And so they want to help families out there that are dealing with that, that, that don't have maybe the care or the money to, to get, maybe have the things they need to make their life a little bit easier. They're going to help supply that with the funds that they raise. So it'll be a lot of fun. We'll have former Alabama uh, football, basketball, baseball, the gymnasts come out for it. All of our, the girls that we knew that were gymnasts at Alabama at the time we were there. When I was there at that time in Robbie, uh, the athletic, uh, the whole athletics was so close. Like, we, yeah. I mean, when we had Friday or Saturday nights off, we all went to parties together. We had parties at people's houses, and it was at a player's house, um, you know, track team, everybody. We were just like a very close-knit group. So we've stayed that way, and we hope we're going to raise a bunch of money tomorrow out of Highland Park for Striker Strong. Great, great cause. Yeah. All right, uh, don't forget, guys, uh, to like and subscribe to the Bama Insider YouTube channel. Give us a thumbs up as we hang out with you every single day, getting you updated on when guys commit to Alabama – uh, recruiting at its best. Anytime Nick Saban speaks, anything Alabama, we have it for you here on the Bama Insider YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, give us a thumbs up. Get a full year of Bama Insider on three for just a dollar. That's now that we're part of on three. We want you to join us there as well. Special thanks to Chris Daughtry and uh, Kyle Henderson, Jay Barker. I'm Mick Gillespie. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll talk to you again Friday night, six to eight, the uh, and, tailgate yeah, show. And make your prize pick. Get it done. Get the prize pick done. You become a multimillionaire. <laughs> Roll Tide.